Mr Speaker, the post office IT scandal is one of the greatest miscarriages of justice in our nation's history, and I'm determined that the victims get the justice and redress that they deserve. Today, we're introducing legislation to quash convictions resulting from this scandal. The Department for Business and Trade will be responsible for the new redress scheme, and we're widening access to the optional £75,000 payment. Hundreds of innocent sub-postmasters have fought long and hard for justice. With this bill, we will deliver it. Yeah. Meetings with ministerial colleagues and others, in addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Abdul Khan. Yeah. Mr Speaker, despite serious opposition from the Archbishop of Canterbury, three former Home Secretaries and three Government Ministers' advisers on anti-Semitism, social cohesion and on political violence, the levelling up sector is due to widen the definition of extremism tomorrow. Whilst on the benches opposite, members peddle far-right conspiracy theories about Islamists and Muslims taking over Britain. Shouldn't the Prime Minister's priority be getting his own house in order and stepping out extremism, racism and Islamophobia from within his Conservative Party? And will the Prime Minister finally take Islamophobia seriously and agree to the definition? Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, discrimination has no place in our society. And it's important, to distinguish, it's important to distinguish between strongly felt political debate on one hand and unacceptable acts of abuse, intimidation and violence on the other. I would urge him to wait for the details of the strategy. It's a sensitive matter, but it's one that we must tackle because there has been a rise in extremists who are trying to hijack our democracy. That must be confronted. And he talks about peddling conspiracy theories. I would just point him in the direction of his previous Labour candidate in Rochdale. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Armed Forces personnel who served their country for 15, uh, 15 years are eligible for the Long Service Good Conduct Medal, and similar medals are in place for those who make a career of serving in the police, the fire, the ambulance service, and the Coast Guard. But as I learnt on a recent visit to Bournemouth Hospital, where I met the dedicated staff there, no such accolade is in place for the NHS. Would the Prime Minister please support my campaign to see if this anomaly can be corrected, so the nation can formally recognise those who devote much of their working lives in the NHS to helping others. Yeah. Prime Minister. My uh, right honourable friend is right that our incredible NHS staff deserve our utmost thanks for their service. And I'm pleased that many NHS organisations, as he knows, have their own schemes in place to do that. We also, of course, recognise NHS staff who are outstanding for our honours system, and MPs are able to acknowledge their work through the NHS Parliamentary Awards, and nominations remain open for that, and I would encourage colleagues uh, to avail themselves of it. But I will make sure that he gets to meet the Secretary of State to discuss his specific proposals further. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I welcome the legislation on the post office scandal? Mr Speaker, this week we lost the formidable Tommy McAvoy. He served his hometown of Rutherglen and the Labour government with loyalty and good humour, and we send our deepest sympathies to his wife, Eleanor, and their family. We also learned that the Right Honourable Member for Maidenhead will be taking her well-deserved retirement. She has served this House and her constituents with a real sense of duty, and her unwavering commitment to ending modern slavery is commended by all of us. We thank her for her service. Is the Prime Minister proud to be bankrolled by someone using racist and misogynist language when he says the member for Hackney North and Stoke Newington makes you want to hate all black women? Minister. Mr Speaker, the alleged comments were wrong, they were racist, and he has now, as I said, the comments were wrong, they were racist. He has rightly apologised for them, and that remorse, and that remorse should be accepted, Mr Speaker. There is no place for racism in Britain, and the government that I lead is living proof of that. Mr Speaker, the man bankrolling the Prime Minister also said that the member for Hackney North should be shot. How low would he have to sink 
what racist, woman-hating threat of violence would he have to make before the Prime Minister plucked up the courage to hand back the £10 million that he's taken from him? Mr Speaker, as I said, the gentleman apologised genuinely for his comments, and that remorse should be accepted. But he talks about language. He, he might want to reflect on the double standards of his deputy leader, of his deputy leader calling her opponent scum, Mr. Speaker. His shadow, his shadow, fo his shadow foreign secretary, the shadow foreign secretary, comparing conservatives to Nazis, Mr. Speaker, and the man that he wanted to make chancellor. The man that he wanted to make Chancellor talking about lynching a female minister. His silence on that speaks volumes. Mr Speaker, the difference is he's scared of his party. I've changed my party. And Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker. I want to hear both the Prime Minister and leave the opposition. Here's some. Two weeks ago, the Prime Minister invited himself into everyone's living room at six o'clock on a Friday evening. No one asked him to give that speech. He chose to do it. He chose to anoint himself as the great healer and pose as some kind of unifier. But when the man bankrolling his election says the member for Hackney North should be shot, he suddenly finds himself tongue-tied, shrinking in sophistry, hoping he can deflect for long enough that we'll all go away. What does the Prime Minister think it was about the hundreds of millions of pounds of NHS contracts given to Frank Hester by his government that first attracted him to giving £10 million to the Tory party in the first place? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I'm absolutely not going to take any lectures from somebody... I'm somebody, I'm somebody who chose to represent an anti-Semitic terrorist group, Hizbut Tahrir, who chose to serve a leader who let anti-Semitism run rife in this Labour Party. Those are his actions, those are his values, and that's how he should be judged. Mr Speaker, the problem is he's describing a Labour Party that no longer exists. I'm describing, I'm describing a man who is bankrolling that up in general election. Um, oh. Keir Starmer. They, they can shout all they like. Two weeks ago, he marched them out like fools to defend Islamophobia, and now the member for Ashfield is warming up the opposition benches for them. And yesterday, yesterday, he sent them out to play down racism and misogyny until he was forced to change course. He won't hand the money back. He won't comment on how convenient it is that a man handed huge NHS contracts by his government is now his party's biggest donor. You have to wonder what the point is of a prime minister who can't lead and a party that can't govern. And Mr Speaker, national insurance contributions fund state pensions and the NHS. So is the Prime Minister's latest unfunded £46 billion promise to scrap national insurance going to be paid for by cuts to state pensions or cuts to the NHS? So, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, it's, I'm glad he's brought up the budget. It's about time that he spoke about his plans. Because what have we heard, Mr. Speaker, from the Shadow Chief Secretary, the Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, confirmed? Sure. Shh, Prime Minister. <laughs> the Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury has confirmed that the Labour Party will not be sticking to the Conservative government spending plans. So we now have a litany. A litany of unfunded promises on the NHS, on mental health, on dentistry, on breakfast clubs, and that doesn't even include the £28 billion 2030 eco pledge that he's still committed to. But what we all know, Mr. Speaker, is that while we're cutting taxes, Labour's unfunded promises mean higher taxes for working Britain. No, Mr Speaker, the Labour Party will not be sticking to his completely unfunded £46 billion promise. But he thinks he can, he can trick people into believing that, but simply shaking the Tory magic money tree will bring it into existence. No, no, let, let, let's be clear. 80% of national insurance is spent 
on social security and pensions, 20% is spent on the NHS. So he's either cutting pensions or the NHS, or he will have to raise other taxes or borrowing. Which is it, Prime Minister? Mr Speaker, I know, I know it's not a strong point, but if you actually listened to the Chancellor last week, what he would have seen is NHS spending is going up, Mr Speaker. It's going up. It's a plan that's backed by the NHS CEO, who says that we're giving her what she needs, and at the same time, we are responsibly cutting taxes for millions of people in work. An average worker benefiting from a £900 tax cut, Mr Speaker. But what I'm hearing from him is he's against our plans to cut national insurance. The highest tax burden since the Second World War. I did listen to the Chancellor. £46 billion of unfunded commitments. They tried that under the last administration and everybody else is paying the price. But two weeks ago, the Prime Minister promised to crack down on those spreading hate. Today, he shrunk at the first challenge. Yeah. Last week, he promised fantasy tax cuts. Now he's pretending it can all be paid for with no impact on pensions or the NHS. All we need now, Mr Speaker, is an especially hardy lettuce, and it could be 2022 <laughs> all over again. Is it any wonder that he's too scared to call an election yeah. when the public can see that the only way to protect their country, their pension and their NHS from the madness of this Tory party is by voting Labour. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, again... No, Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, he talks about pensions. Pensions are going up by around £900 in this year. It's this government that's protected the triple lock for the last 10 years. He talks about supporting working people. It's this government that's cutting taxes for every single person in work, Mr Speaker. It's this government that's investing in the NHS. But all we have from him, are, all we have from him is a £28 billion unfunded promise. Mr Speaker, I had a look at it. I had a look at it. It's here. It's all here. Making Britain a clean energy superpower. He's still stuck to it, Mr Speaker. And if you look through it carefully, there's billions in spending he's already committed to Scotland, billions for Wales. There's actually money for North London too, I notice. But the problem is, the problem is... The problem is, none of it is funded. So why doesn't he come clean and tell him under his plans, Britain people's taxes are going up, Mr Speaker? Mr Speaker, millions of people around the UK and Europe have been inspired by the brilliance of Six Nations rugby. And Premier League clubs like Gloucester Rugby, which were funded during the pandemic through loans authorised by the Prime Minister as then Chancellor, have always been grateful for being kept solvent. But the Prime Minister will also know that the finances of some of these clubs are fragile and that the current loan repayment schemes could be crippling. So will my right honourable friend ask the Sports Minister and the Treasury to try and find a solution through this so that taxpayer interests are protected and all of us can go on being inspired by top-class rugby for years to come? Yeah. Well, Mr Minister. Speaker, my honourable friend is absolutely right that we stepped in with a £150 million financial lifeline to ensure the survival of Premiership Rugby League clubs during the pandemic. And I am told that DCMS is working with Sport England as the agent to talk to borrowers with concerns about their loan agreements and any ones that do have concerns should contact Sport England in the normal way. But I can also proudly tell him that we are talking to the Rugby Football Union and the Premiership League to secure not just the future of Rugby Union, but also his local Gloucester Rugby. Yeah. We come to the leader of the SNP, Stephen Flynn. Yeah. So, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I wish to begin by wishing Ramadan Mubarak to Muslims across these aisles. Mr Speaker, the Conservative Party have accepted a £10 million donation from an individual who has said that one of our parliamentary colleagues in this chamber should be shot. Yeah. Why is the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom putting money before morals? Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, as I said, the comments were wrong. The gentleman in question has apologised for them, and that remorse should be accepted.
Stephen Flynn. This is complete rubbish. The gentleman in question apologised for being rude. He wasn't rude. He was racist. He was odious. And he was downright bloody dangerous. Yep. Now, on Monday, the number 10 said, we've seen an unacceptable rise in extremist activity, which is seeking to divide our society and hijack our democratic institutions. Isn't the extremism that we should all be worried about? The, the views of those Tory donors that we've read about this week. Yeah. Prime Minister. No, Mr Speaker, there has actually been a rise in extremist activity that is seeking to hijack our democratic institutions. Yeah. It's important, it is important, it is important that we have the tools to tackle this threat. That's what the extremism strategy will do, and I would urge him to wait for the community secretary to release the details. Well, Gwens. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sub postmasters across the country will welcome the government's announcement today on the introduction of legislation to overturn the convictions of those who were wrongly convicted. But can my right honourable friend reassure this House that that legislation will be passed as quickly as possible and we will support all sub postmasters right across our United Kingdom? Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, as I said, I want to pay tribute to all postmasters who have campaigned tirelessly for justice, including those who tragically won't see the justice that they deserve. Today's legislation marks an important step in finally clearing their names, and across this House we owe it to them to progress this legislation as soon as possible before summer recess so that we can deliver the justice that they have fought for. We're continuing to work with our counterparts in Scotland and Northern Ireland as they develop their plans, but regardless of where and how convictions are quashed, redress will be paid to victims across the whole of our United Kingdom on exactly the same basis. I did. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The future of children's cancer services... And David. Thank you, Ms. Speaker. The, the future of children's cancer services in my constituency across South West London, across Surrey, Sussex, and beyond will be decided by NHS England tomorrow. The existing service is world leading and has saved the lives of countless children. Many of us who have engaged with the consultation process feel that a wrong decision is about to be made, ignoring risk to children's cancer care by moving them to the Evelina. If the Evelina is chosen tomorrow, will the Prime Minister personally intervene and delay any final decision until he's met with myself and concerned, concerned MPs across the House so he can prevent these risks to our children's cancer services? Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, as the Honourable Gentleman, right Honourable Gentleman knows, uh, decisions about clinical provision are rightly made by clinicians in local areas across the country. Uh, more generally, we're investing in more oncologists, radiologists and community diagnostic centres, which are contributing to cancer treatment being at record levels. But I will, of course, ensure that he and colleagues uh, get a meeting with the Secretary of State. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Radical Islamists pose a serious threat to our nation's security. Oh, yeah. And I agree with my right honourable friend that we must urgently address this. But reports that the government wishes to broaden the definition of extremism are concerning because in separating the definition of extremism from actual violence and harm, we may criminalise people with a wide range of legitimate views and have a chilling effect on free speech. So can my right honourable friend reassure me that instead of trying to police people's thought and speech, as those opposite clearly wish to do, the government will instead target the specific groups that foster terrorism and those who fund them? Prime Minister. Uh, my uh, moral friend makes a good point, and that's why uh, the strategy that I would urge her to wait for will, I think, be one that she can support because it is our duty to make sure the government has the tools to tackle the threat that she rightly identifies and highlights. And this is absolutely not about silencing those with private and peaceful <laughs> beliefs, nor will it impact free speech, which we on this side of the House will always strive to protect. Janet Ted. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. Children deserve the right to breathe clean air. Yes. However, many schools are in areas with high levels of air pollution. Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London, has announced... Keep going, Keep going, 
Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London, has announced a pilot for 200 of London's most impacted schools to access air quality filters so children can breathe clean air Excellent. in their classrooms. Excellent. Does the Prime Minister support this pilot and will he implement similar measures across our country? Yeah. Minister. Mr Speaker, I'm pleased that latest published figures show that air pollution has reduced significantly since 2010 and partly due to our targets Partly due to our legally binding targets to reduce concentrations, they will continue to reduce over the following years. And on top of that, we've also provided almost a billion pounds to help local authorities across the country implement local plans to reduce NO2 and make sure that we can support those impacted by those plans. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I understand the latest scheme that's been considered is to pay migrants thousands of pounds to leave Britain. Prime Minister, let's just leave the ECHR and deport them for free. So far, over 40,000 Brits have signed my petition with the Conservative Post calling for us to leave the European Convention on Human Rights. Will the Prime Minister commit to leaving the ECHR, or at the very least, have it in our manifesto to have a referendum and let Britain decide? Prime Minister. Oh, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is absolutely right that we must do everything we can to secure our borders ensure that those who come here illegally do not have the ability to stay. That's why our Rwanda scheme and legislation is so important. And what I've said repeatedly and will happily say to her again is that I will not let a foreign court block our ability to send people to Rwanda when the time comes. Lou Savile Roberts. Do you have somebody over there? The National Theatre production, Nye, which stars Michael Sheen, celebrates at the end a transformational increase in life expectancy since the founding of the NHS. But UCL findings indicate that austerity policies between 2010 and 2019 are responsible for a three-year setback in life expectancy progress. Does he, or the leader of the opposition for that matter, think public services can withstand an extra £20 billion pounds of cuts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. Yeah, well, Mr. M Mr Speaker, first of all, I'm pleased that the National Theatre have received significant funding from the Chancellor in the recent budget to support their fantastic work across the UK. But I, I am surprised to hear her raising the NHS when it's her party that's propping up the Welsh Labour government yeah. in Wales, which has absolutely the worst NHS performance of any part of the United Kingdom. Yeah. Mr. Mr Speaker, may I thank my right honourable friend for meeting me six weeks ago to discuss the plight of victims of COVID-19 vaccine damage. And may I ask him, following that discussion and his very sympathetic response during the GB People's Forum to Mr John Watt, who himself is a victim of COVID-19 vaccine damage, whether the government will be supporting my COVID-19 vaccine payments bill this Friday. I really well, Mr Speaker, can I thank my honourable friend for raising the issue and the conversation that I had with him previously and extend my sympathies to all of those who have been affected by this. I, I will, of course, make sure that he can meet with the Secretary of State to discuss his bill. And as I committed to him, we are looking at the issue in some detail to make sure that the policies we've got are providing the support that they need to. Marsha de Cordon. Speaker. The Prime Minister stood outside Downing Street saying that he wanted to root out hate and extremism. Can you imagine? Yet it shamefully took him more than 24 hours Shame. to finally say the remarks by the Tories' biggest donor that looking at the right honourable member for Hackney North and Stoke Newin, Newington makes you want to hate all Shame. black women yeah. were indeed racist. Yeah. Yeah. In November, the Prime Minister accepted a non-cash donation to the tune of £15,000 from Frank Hester for the use of his helicopter. Mm. So will he reimburse him, yes or no? <coughs> no? No, Mr Speaker. And I'm pleased that... I, I'm pleased that... I'm pleased that... The gentleman is supporting a party that represents one of the most diverse governments in this country's history, led by this country's first British Asian Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, later today, I look forward to voting for a tax cut for yeah. thousands yeah. of my constituents.
a national insurance tax cut that will mean £900 off the tax bill for thousands of my constituents. After listening to the rhetoric from the Leader of the Opposition today, does the Prime Minister expect that the main opposition party will vote against this afternoon's tax cuts? Oh. 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 Well, my right honourable right friend raises an excellent question, because whilst on this side of the House we believe in a country where hard work is rewarded and people can keep more of their hard-earned money, which is why we're cutting their taxes by an average of £900 each, we hear consistently from the party opposite, not only do they disagree with that approach, they continue to cling to unfunded spending promises that will put taxes up, but also the Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, we learnt just yesterday, described our plan to end the double taxation on work as morally abhorrent. And that is a contrast between us and them. Labour will put your taxes up and the Conservatives will keep cutting them. Thank you, but, <clears throat> thank you Mr Speaker. Many of us backbenchers, and now it seems the Prime Minister himself, have taken to referring to the European Court of Human Rights as a foreign court, as if there's something inherently wrong with things being foreign or people being right. foreign. Exactly. In what way can a court that the UK has belonged to since 1953, which has an Irish president and a UK justice with an LLB from Dundee, be considered foreign? I think the House needs to hear the Prime Minister commit today to the UK's continued membership of a court and a convention which protected our rights and freedoms for over 70 years. Yeah. Yeah. So, Mr Speaker, when it comes to the issue of tackling illegal migration, when Parliament expresses a clear view on what it believes should happen, supports that with legislation, and that we believe we are acting in accordance with all our international obligations, I have been very clear that I will not let a foreign court stop us from sending illegal migrants to Rwanda. That is the right policy and, in fact, the only way to ensure security of our borders and end the unfairness of illegal migration. Edward Lee. As a general election is not just a mere expression of opinion but a serious choice, will my right honourable friend agree that there is only one potential party of government that has the will, the inclination and the determination to stop mass illegal and legal migration, and that is the Conservative Party. Let's unite our movement and do that. I agree, agree with my honourable friend entirely. I agree with my honourable friend entirely. And we know this because not only has the Royal Honourable Gentleman opposite opposed the scheme, he's been clear that even when the scheme is implemented and working, he would still scrap it, Mr Speaker, which tells you everything you need to know. On this issue, their values are simply not those of the British people. There's only one party that's going to stop the boats. It's the Conservative Party. Mr Speaker, under this Conservative Government's watch, Thames Water have dumped over 72 billion litres of sewage into London's rivers, all whilst racking up multi-billion pound debts, and reports are now that they could go bust any day. Despite this, the Government is still refusing to publish their contingency plans for the collapse of our country's biggest water firm. So, yes or no, does the Prime Minister believe that Thames Water will still exist by the end of the year? Prime Minister. Yeah, well, Mr Speaker, it wouldn't be right for me to comment on individual companies, but what I can say is that our ambitious storm overflow reduction plan is backed by £60 billion of capital investment. We now monitor every single storm overflow across England and have legislated to introduce unlimited penalties on water companies that breach their obligations. The independent regulator and the Environment Agency have the powers they need to hold water companies, wherever they are, to account. Natalie Elphick. Um, later this year, a new digital EU border system will come in, and yet key changes that are required, key details, have still not been decided by the EU. There are urgent decisions that are needed on additional funding and preparation to keep Dover clear and Kent moving through with its traffic. 
Can my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, assure me that this issue is being taken seriously at the highest levels of government and that funding and support will be made available mm. to keep Dover clear, support the residents of Dover and Deal and Kent, and to secure our vital cross channel trade and tourism? Yeah. Prime Minister. Yeah. No, my uh, honourable friend is right to raise this issue, and I can assure her that it is being discussed at the highest levels of government between UK ministers and EU and French counterparts to make sure that we have practical and constructive solutions that will ease the flow of traffic in the way that she describes and will benefit her local communities. Rachel McCaskill. Thank you, Mr Speaker. 158 days and there was no peace and no justice. There was no food, there was no clean water, there was no sanitation and no medical aid. There are just no words left as disease is spreading and the death toll is rising, not least amongst children, victims of these atrocities. It is evident that the Prime Minister's plan is not working. So will he change track for the sake of these children and so many more and work to secure a bilateral immediate ceasefire between Israel and Hamas? Prime Minister. (laughs) Mr Speaker, I've said repeatedly that we are incredibly concerned about the growing humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Too many civilians have lost their lives and nowhere near enough aid is getting through. And in contrast to what the Honourable Lady said, actually the UK is playing a leading role in alleviating that suffering, just recently increasing the amount of aid this year to £100 million. Just today, 150 tonnes of UK aid is due to arrive in Gaza, and a full field hospital flown from Manchester to the Middle East last week will also arrive in Gaza in the coming days, staffed by UK and local medics to provide life-saving care. We are doing absolutely everything we can, working with our allies, to bring much-needed aid to the people of Gaza. Show them report. Mr Speaker, will my right honourable friend join me in thanking the maternity team at the Royal Cornwall Hospital at Trelisk in my Truro and Falmouth constituency for all their outstanding work they've done to improve maternity (laughs) services over the last few years. Their sheer hard work, along with the coming new Women and Children's Hospital, mean that there are now no midwifery vacancies in Cornwall, which I think you'll agree is a fantastic achievement. Well, can I thank my uh, honourable friend for highlighting the improvement in maternity services at the Royal Cornwall? And she, in particular, is a tireless campaigner for reducing baby loss, and I commend her for her recent work on the introduction of baby loss certificates. And as she knows, we are committed to a new women and children's hospital for my honourable friend's local trust in 2030 as part of the new hospital programme. Sarah Dyke. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituents in Summerton and Froome, working together with the Langport Transport Group, submitted a robust strategic business case to the government in July 2022 for the reopening of a train station in the Summerton and Langport area, a train station that would connect over 50,000 people to the rail network, boost the local economy and support local people to reduce their reliance on their cars. Almost two years on, they are still waiting for a response. So does the Prime Minister support this project and can he provide confidence to my constituents that their hard work to drive this vital project forward has not been futile? Prime Minister. Uh, Well, Mr Mr. Speaker, Conservatives in the South West are rightly championing the reopen of local stations and actually recently Columpton and Wellington will be one of the places that receives funding as a result of our decision on HS2. But it's because of that decision that we now have freed up billions of pounds of funding to invest in local transport across the country and it will be local leaders that will be put in charge of that many to prioritise their local needs. Yay. Final question, Mark Francois. Thanks. Mm. Prime Minister, in the 1930s, one of your less illustrious predecessors, Neville Chamberlain, so denuded the British Armed Forces of funding until it was too late that we failed to deter Adolf Hitler and 50 million people tragically died in the Second World War. Russia has invaded Ukraine. China is threatening Taiwan. British shipping is being attacked by Houthis in the Red Sea. As the son of a D-Day veteran, could you please assure me and the House of Commons we are not going to forget the lessons of history and make the same mistake again. Prime Minister. 
Well, can I thank my honourable friend for his tireless campaigning for our armed forces, and he's right to champion them and the role that they play. And I agree with him wholeheartedly that, sadly, the world that we are living in is becoming both more challenging strategically and more dangerous. And in response to those challenges, we must invest more in our armed forces. That is exactly what we are doing, with the largest uplift since the Cold War, and recently topped up with billions of pounds to strengthen our nuclear enterprise and rebuild stockpiles. He rightly mentioned the threat posed by the Houthis and Russia and Ukraine, and I know that he will be proud of the role that the United Kingdom is playing in both of those situations. We are respected and valued by our allies, but most importantly, we on this side of the House will do whatever it takes to keep our country safe. Yeah. Yeah. That completes Prime Minister's questions. Well, that was Prime Minister's questions. Uh, quite a lot to chew over. Let's bring in our Deputy Political Editor, Sam Coates, who joins us now. Sam, uh, we spoke before it started about how Rishi Sunak needed to galvanise the backbenchers with his performance today. Did he do that? Well, I think it was notable that you had three Tory MPs who were quite sceptical towards the Prime Minister stand up and make relatively pointed remarks towards him. I think that alone tells you the fragility at the moment that you, you get in parts of the Conservative Party. Look, Rishi Sunak had a difficult job today. Today was the first time we've seen him in days. And over the last few days, since we saw him last, it's been a bin fire in the Conservative Party. You have the row that we heard throughout Prime Minister's questions about the donation, uh, the donation, um, the big donations from the donor uh, who use language, and when challenged, eventually the Prime Minister came out and said it was racist. Uh, you have the defection of Lee Anderson. Uh, this was the first appearance since then. You also have um, this being the first uh, appearance of the Prime Minister, really since the, the, the budget, which a lot of Tory MPs felt didn't land as well as it could. Um, was it a knock-it-out-of-the-park performance by the Prime Minister? Probably not. Was it a disastrous performance by the pr Prime Minister? Pr probably not either. It was, it was somewhere in the middle. Um, but uh, I thought that uh, the faces of the people around the Prime Minister sort of told us a lot. Oliver Dowden, I mean, maybe he's just not got a very expressive face, but he didn't look exactly enthralled by... Well, no, and, and cleverly, on either side, and, and you know, both and quite then, stony faced And maybe Penny Morden should come off her phone occasionally. Um, but I think that uh, it, you've got a sense of a bit of a Prime Minister on, on probation. Now, in just a moment, we're going to listen to a bit of the exchange with Keir Starmer. We haven't, we haven't talked about that, but... Before we do, the Prime Minister's principal line in defence or in response to questions about Frank Hester and his comments towards Diana Abbott was that the comments were wrong, but the remorse of Frank Hester should be accepted. I was fascinated by that line. The remorse of this donor who says things that the Prime Minister thinks were unacceptable in 2019 should be be accepted. Now, Jane, the question I want you to ask is, uh, in a second when you watch that exchange, is why does the Prime Minister think that the remorse should be accepted? Is it A, because he looked into the donor or spoke to the donor on the phone or uh, uh, looked into his eyes and decided that the donor was sincere in his apology and regret and repudiates what he said in the past? Or is it B, because it's an awful lot of money to give mm. back if they decide on another course? That's the line that Keir Starmer was dancing around. Let's hear it. Is the Prime Minister proud to be bankrolled by someone using racist and misogynist language when he says the member for Hackney North and Stoke Newington makes you want to hate all black women? Minister. Mr Speaker, the alleged comments were wrong, they were racist, and he has now... As I said, the comments were wrong, they were racist. He has rightly apologised for them, and that remorse and that remorse should be accepted, Mr Speaker. There is no place for racism in Britain, and the government that I lead is living proof of that. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the man bankrolling the Prime Minister also said that the member for Hackney North should be shot. How low would he have to sink? What racist, woman-hating threat of violence would he have to make before the Prime Minister plucked up the courage to hand back the £10 million that he's taken from him? Mr Speaker, as I said, the gentleman apologised genuinely for his comments and that remorse should be accepted. But he talks about language. 
he, he might want to reflect on the double standards of his deputy leader, of his deputy leader calling her opponent scum, Mr. Speaker. His shadow, his, shadow, his shadow Foreign Secretary, the Shadow Foreign Secretary comparing Conservatives to Nazis, Mr Speaker. And the man that he wanted to make Chancellor, the man that he wanted to make Chancellor talking about lynching a female minister. His silence on that speaks volumes. So Rishi Sunak not giving back the 10 million, also not, not reimbursing for a helicopter ride that, that this man paid for either. I thought it was interesting during, during that exchange, uh, the camera focused in on Diane Abbott a, a couple of times. At the end of Prime Minister's questions, Keir Starmer went up. I think we can bring you the images now. Uh, he left the front bench uh, and went up uh, the shadow front bench and went up uh, to the back of the House of Commons where Diane Abbott was sitting uh, to speak to her. It was a question that quite a lot of uh, Labour uh, MPs were asked yesterday as to whether or, or not Diane Abbott, who is uh, currently uh, suspended from the Labour Party, whether or not uh, they had actually reached out to her. Well, he... Uh, physically went up and, and spoke to her today. How do you think Keir Starmer did today? Did he have the wind in his sails? So, um, it, it was, in some ways, a gift of a Prime Minister's questions for, for Keir Starmer, but I didn't think it was his greatest ever performance. There were some lines that landed, but, but he sort of jumped around topics. I don't think that his performance at this Prime Minister's questions will, will go down in history. Um, it, it, the whole thing is a bit more complicated for Keir Starmer uh, than, than, than perhaps people like to admit. You know, um, here we have uh, an unfolding story about Diane Abbott, a, a, a Labour MP that the Labour Party has suspended and, and, and at time of speaking doesn't look like she would be able to uh, stand again in her, in her hackney seat. And, and suspension for complex and complicated reasons surrounding racism. Uh, yes, exactly. And um, you've got a situation where... Uh, I think the Labour Party are basically confirming that that suspension isn't isn't going to be lifted, and yet you just saw pictures of him going and um, sort of, you know, doffing his cap to her in the in the Commons chamber. So that's a bit complicated. Um, the Prime Minister got into the sort of what aboutery of like, well, what about these comments by Angela Rayner? It's interesting. Angela Rayner comes up a lot. I think the Conservative Party see her as a as a as a as a weak uh, as a weak flank. I think that must be coming through in their in their focus groups. Um, I know from. Uh, uh, talking to people in, in government, even through Prime Minister's questions, that they are uh, pushing other comments by Labour donors. Uh, I think there are some comments by uh, Dale Vince on um, uh, about what's going on in uh, Israel and in the um, occupied territories that are uh, they are suggesting maybe Dale Vince should hand back uh, uh, be handed back some of his donations. Um, so I think although it was sort of his to win, it wasn't an absolute slam dunk, and it's not necessarily his performance that will be the most memorable. OK, thanks very much for that, Sam. Well, uh, we're going to get more reaction here on Sky News. Uh, we've just heard uh, at PMQs with our panel of MPs. They're going to be joining us after the break. Stay with us for that. Hornby's 40th anniversary. I can't believe that I co-founded it 40 years ago with my mum, Virginia McKenna, and my dad, Bill Travers. And, and what a great way to, to celebrate with these two Young lions, Zar and Jamil, they, as you rightly say, they came from a, a zoo, but actually from a, an ostrich farm. And it was Ukrainian animal activists who first alerted everyone to the situation, managed to get them, the animals away from the ostrich farm and via various route through Poland and then uh, into Belgium to a halfway house. And then we've been able with the help of incredible people, you know, British Airways Holidays, uh, Cargo Lux, DHL, our team at Shamwari in South Africa. It's, it's been an incredible team effort to get them to South Africa where they will live the rest of their lives. It's not complete freedom. It can never be complete freedom. These animals have been in captivity uh, too long and it would be too difficult and too dangerous to return them fully to the wild, but they will have a life worth living. The lions do need all sorts of paperwork. In fact, it's one of the biggest challenges that, that anyone who moves uh, animals from one country to another, wild animals from one country to another, especially when it's difficult to get the original paperwork when you have a country like Ukraine, which, was face, which is facing so many challenges. You have to have the export paperwork, the health paperwork, the veterinary paperwork, 
to get them out of the country. And then you have to have the reciprocal paperwork in South Africa and hats off to both the Ukrainian and the South African authorities for expediting the paperwork to allow this move to go ahead, because without it, it can't. Well, they will have an enclosure. It'll be about the size of a football field. It's natural uh, South African bush, which uh, at least ancestrally they would have evolved to live in. Uh, they'll be looked after 365 days a year. We have a, an incredible expert team down there led by Glenn and Catherine and Dr. Johan Joubert, who is a, a world-renowned veterinarian, uh, along with the other big cats that we've rescued, and they will have a quality of life. Welcome back. You're watching Sky News. We've just been watching Prime Minister's questions. Let's discuss what we've just heard now. I'm joined here in the studio by the Conservative MP for Peterborough, Paul Bristow, the Labour MP for Denton and Reddish, uh, Andrew Gwynne, and the SNP's Shadow Treasury spokesperson, Alison Sulis. Thank you all so much uh, for coming along. Um, Paul, let, let's start with you. Uh, racism, who's running the party, Lee Anderson on, on the opposition benches. It, it's, it's tricky to know what to, where to start, really. Did Rishi Sunak fill you with confidence there today? Well, I know how I'm going to start. Uh, I'm no supporter of Diane Abbott. I'm certainly no fan of what she said. Sam talked about uh, Keir Starmer going up and, and talking to her. I thought that was a very human reaction, actually. When someone is being racially abused, uh, I think that's a very human reaction to go up to them and offer that sympathy. And I think once we've got a situation where... Uh, it's how we move forward, I think, is what's important. When we've got a situation where MPs are being threatened, are being abused, I think we can all unite around that being unacceptable. I think to make it an issue about money and all this sort of stuff, I think, is, is unhelpful. We've got a situation where we've now got the first non-white British Prime Minister. We've got one of the most di diverse cabinets. We've come so far since Diane Abbott became the first black female Member of Parliament. I think that's what's important. I think what's important is that we stamp out racism wherever we see it. We also saw Keir Starmer mentioning Theresa May and paying tributes to her at, at the beginning of a Prime Minister's questions. Uh, is he a man who looks like his Prime Minister already? Well, I think the more pe people get to see of Keir Starmer, the better, really. I think uh, we need a lot more scrutiny over Keir Starmer and what he'll do when he's Prime Minister. He does have this enormous black hole. He seems to be uh, in his finances and he seems to be sleepwalking. The less he says, the more he flip-flops, he thinks he can become Prime Minister. But there's going to be that shining light on his plans for, as far as I can see it, open borders for plans to realignment with the European Union, certainly his tax and spend plans, because that's what he is, after all, an old tax and spend uh, Labour Party potential Prime Minister. Hold on. I'm not going to accept you're, you're, that. You're, you're shaking your head. It's your turn now. From the government that has increased taxes to the highest level since the Second World War, even with last week's budget, taxes are higher under the Tories than they have ever been. So are you going to and, reverse uh, those tax and, and, and hold on, Paul. Those tax cuts. Hold on, Paul. You talk about unfunded um, tax and spending. In the budget, the Chancellor announced effectively getting rid of national insurance. That is a £46 billion unfunded and very risky commitment that you've made without saying how state pensions are going to be paid for because your state pensions are directly linked to your national insurance contributions and how you're going to pay for the NHS and other welfare benefits of which national insurance contributions play a part. So oh, yeah. are you going to put Andrew. up income tax by 6%? So, because that is what you would have to do just to stand still. Andrew, you're a very intelligent man, and you know that national insurance doesn't go into a little pot that says Andrew Gwynn. No, it national goes national insurance. National insurance, national, insur national insurance is just general taxation, like any other form of taxation. So you're getting... And the, ability, and, and the discussion about how to spend taxpayers' money, not government money, taxpayers' money... You know that, that state is made, pensions that's made at a treasury are determined it does not go, national it insurance does not contributions. It does not go into a little pot that says Andrew Gwynn. It goes, you understand it that, don't you? OK, and Andrew, so if Labour get in, austerity or tax rises, what's it going to be? How well, are you going to pay the bills? I think... Probably both. Well, hold on, Paul. I think I need to answer your question about national insurance contributions because, no, it doesn't go into a pot called Andrew Gwynn Good. or Paul Bristow. It goes into the National Insurance Fund and your state pensions... 
pension, your state pension entitlement, you know this as, as well as I do, your state pension entitlement is calculated on the level of national insurance that you've paid it's just another form of income your, tax, Andrew. throughout your working life. It's just another form of income tax. So are you tax. going to put six pence in the pound on income tax you... to compensate from national insurance? It just goes into 46, the exchequer, Andrew. £46 billion pounds of unfunded keep saying tax this. cuts. But also... Gentlemen, we're gonna, I'm going to ask you to pause just because we've, we've heard a little bit of both of you. Let's bring, it, let's bring in Alison. Um, Alison, you, you're clearly going to say that the SNP are the ones who are going to sort the economy out in Scotland. Well, what I was going to say is that Labour will not commit to whether it is tax rises or whether it is more austerity. They've been very, very unclear with that. In an interview with Sky News recently, uh, Keir Starmer wouldn't commit to that at all. Uh, the Labour Party are committed to the Tory agenda, to the Tory budget uh, in years going ahead. And we know the devastating effect that that's already having in our public services and the impact that that's having on public health as well. Glasgow Centre for Population Health has done a lot, an awful lot of work on this as well. They've seen that from an improving um, picture of health inequalities, austerity, cost, that 10 years of austerity and more, has cost deeply in terms of people's health and it'll take them another 10 years to get back to even where we were in 2011. That's really damaging. That's an impact on people's health and people's well-being, on their life prospects and their life chances from older people to younger people all the way through. That's devastating and there's a huge cost in that ill health when people, uh, as we can see from the budget uh, and from the budget documents, people are falling out of the workforce because of that ill health and it's desperately important uh, that money goes into the system, not that continual cuts because the public service Services can't cope with that. Paul, um, do, do you think, I mean, we, we talked about um, the glum faces behind Rishi Sunak while he was talking there. Do you think he will be the, the, the Conservative leader by the of time course. of the next general election? Of course he will. He's the Prime Minister. And we go into that uh, general election. I'm confident I'll hold my seat, probably the most marginal out of all of us here. But I'm confident I'll hold my seat. We go into that election. And the choice is this. The choice is either a Labour Party led by Keir Starmer, who's not going to do the things that people want a Conservative government to do, to control our borders, to cut tax, to invest not correctly in public services. It's a real choice between a Labour Party that believes in open borders, a Labour Party that wants to align as closer with the European Union, and a Labour Party who can't decide, as you quite rightly said, whether they're going to reverse these tax cuts or they're going to cut public services. But, Paul, the, the last few days have been a story of unforced errors by the Conservative Party, by Downing Street. It, it has been an absolute bin fire. When, when you watch the Prime Minister at Prime Minister's Questions, do you really genuinely, in your heart of heart, think that there's a guy who can turn around a 26-point poll deficit? Well, I think the Prime Minister's got far better at PMQs in recent weeks. I think he's a pri someone with a plan. And look, the choice is this. The choice is whether we stick with the plan. We heard today that the economy is now not in recession, by the way, that the economy is growing again. It proves that the economic plan is working. We've got £900 now in the pockets of hard-working people. We stick to that plan of economic recovery or we go back to square one with okay, Keir Starmer. I, I hear the talking points. What I didn't hear was you saying, yes, I have the confidence... I've got absolute confidence you think, you that think we can win the next election. ..that Rishi Sunak and can Rishi turn Sunak around a 26-point poll deficit. Well, you think he can do, do that? I wouldn't be on this programme with you here. I wouldn't be fighting my seat if I didn't think that was possible. Why do some of your colleagues seem to think otherwise? Well, that's for them. This is for now. All I know is that the colleagues that I fight fighting similar seats to me are out every weekend knocking on doors and really selling the choice at this election. It's either sticking with the plan that's working, it's getting those... It's getting... Uh, stopping the boats, is getting the debt down, it's, um, the inflation's already half, and it's also making a choice between that plan and Keir Starmer. Do you think Frank Hester's remorse should be accepted? I think, well, I don't know enough about the issue personally, but in the sense that... Though, in, the sen in the sense, I don't know the context of me, but what he said was racist and what he said was wrong. Why do you think the Prime Minister said that Frank Hester's remorse should be accepted? Well, I think... We, uh, just so, so just money. today, we've seen that is in the Labour Party, Andy MacDonald has just been allowed back into the Labour Party. With mm. no focus on that. He made some pretty outrageous statements on Palestinian marches and Sorry, can I get you to answer you? the question? So, do, you but think it, if he, do you think the Prime Minister did it just so he could keep the money? Well, let me just say, if Andy MacDonald's offered genuine remorse, I'm not going to criticise the Labour Party for letting him back in. And I think the same should be done by everybody. Else. Should, You're in a marginal seat. Will you accept money from this man? I will accept... I raise all my own front money. I don't, I don't get money from central office. Uh, CCH, CCH, CCHQ rarely give me National much money spend. because I 
raise a lot of my money locally myself. But you get the benefit of national spend. There's £10 I million. Think, I think you're undermining this racism row by talking about, will someone hand back money? I could easily go to you, Andrew, and say, when Len McCluskey was General Secretary of Unite, when he said, at best, gaslighting comments about anti-Semitism was somehow undermining Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, but that, wasn't that was McCluskey grossly offensive. Yeah. I could say, Unite should hand back all the money that... Uh, so the Labour Party should but hand that back the money that Unite That wasn't this Len's This is a race to the bottom. Money, was this it? is an issue about safety of evidence. Oh, give over. This is an issue about racism. That is what we should be this focusing on. This looks so on. bad to viewers yeah. that you won't say that you will give money back to this man who has said not just deeply offensive things, but dangerous things, you think, shooting an MP. You, for... you think us three coming together, condemning those comments, condemning racism... But is you're an benefiting to from the money. It's, it's a race to the bottom if we go down that route and say, are you going to give back? You, ser you served disgrace. in a shadow cabinet under Paul, Jeremy Corbyn. Paul. It's me turning around and saying you should give back that money that Unite gave to you, okay. he that said, would be a race to the bottom he said, and help okay. nobody. He Andrew, said, Paul, an we're going to take a breath. We know what he said and we know what he's apologised for and we know what the Prime Minister said as well. Um, Andrew Gwynn, Paul Bristow and Alison Thewlis, thank you all so much for watching Prime Minister's Questions and for joining us.